zone all about our universe it's already started that journey um, because it's traveled to the launch pad from los angeles after final test good morning everyone thanks for joining us uh, we're going to get started here um, before we get started um, with our panel i um, just want to remind you of a few housekeeping items for today's webinar um, this is the webinar format and we're going to be running approximately one hour and if you have any questions, please put them in the Q&A section and we will do our best to answer them here. Um, for best viewing, please switch to full screen. And you can also select how you want to view it and you can do side by side um, with the gallery or side by side with the speaker. Um, we do have closed. But if you prefer, um, you can turn off the live transcript or you can drag it down to the lower corner. And with that, um, we're going to get started, and it is my pleasure um, to introduce our host this morning, Dr. Patrick Young. Take it away, Patrick. Good morning. Welcome, everyone, to Arizona State University School of Earth and Space Exploration James Webb Space Telescope Virtual Launch Bluing, Viewing Party. Sorry, that's a mouthful for this hour of the morning. I'd like to thank NASA's astrophysics program, the mission team, and the partners who are making this exciting launch event possible. My name is Patrick Young. I am a professor of astrophysics with the School of Earth and Space Exploration, and I'll be your host this morning. Today, we have an exciting panel of experts from ASU, including Regents Professor Roger Windhorst, who is a co-investigator and interdisciplinary scientist for Webb, and his team, which includes research scientist Rolf Janssen and assistant research scientist Seth Cohen, along with a team of ASU postdoctoral scholars, undergraduate students, and graduate students working on this mission. Now, let's begin. Thank you very much, Patrick. It will be a pleasure to have you all here today and um, see the Ariane. Um, you can see here on the NASA TV being rolled out. That of course happened two days ago. It's on the launch pad now in the early morning, a little foggy there. And I'll give it to uh, Rick to make sure we have the sound of the, the countdown. I think we're about um, uh, 17 minutes um, from launch. And uh, I'd be happy to answer some questions uh, as they come along. I can't always see them in the um, chat so uh, folks will make us aware of any questions. Let's hear it, Rick. See where we stand. 17 and we minutes. We have though. the Telescope Control Center, Mission Control in Baltimore in the US. And that's where the operational teams are standing by to take over the telescope operations. Once it's released from the mothership, that will be about 27 minutes after launch. And they'll be controlling the web telescope for the rest of its life. Very important job. The James Webb Space Telescope is a truly remarkable observatory. People have been working on it for over two decades. Some people have been working on it for their whole professional lives. Uh, Thomas Zabrucken is the head of science at NASA, and he's joining me now just to talk about it. Thomas, I mean, or Dr. Z, as uh, we can also call you. The day has come, all these decades, all this time, all these people working on the telescope, and here we are, 16 minutes and counting to launch. It's a big day, huh? Oh, I'm so amazed, right? We have this telescope on top of this rocket, a telescope that 10,000 plus people have worked on in many ways. And together with that telescope, all the hopes and dreams of those individuals and also tens of thousands of scientists, some of them not even born, that will benefit from these data are there with them waiting for these last minutes of countdown for its journey to, to space. I'm guessing people are feeling a combination of emotional excitement, What's going through people's minds, do you think? Oh, I think there's a tremendous sense of accomplishment. Whenever you're on top of a rocket, many things went really, really well. There's tremendous pride. There's always a little bit of anxiety. We know 
Launching is hard. Uh, we have one of the absolute best teams in the world working on this right now, so I'm confident in that. We're super excited. I mean, I just an amazing day today. And, and what are you most excited about, Dr. Z? Well, I, I'm a scientist, so for me, uh, besides the technology, that really is a marvel. I mean, it's really the best we can do. What I'm thinking about is really looking at the universe in new light. We have never seen the universe how Webb will show it to us. And can you just imagine going back in time, 13 and a half billion years, it boggles your mind, even as a professional astrophysicist, kind of just think about all the new things we're going to learn about. So it looks like we have some questions in okay, the Q&A now. Thank you for joining us. And I, I want to wish you and all the teams um, Rick, can we please get, thank you. So, yeah. So we have a question uh, from Pam Jackson. Uh, why is JWST being launched from French Guiana? Well, that is because uh, 18 years ago, um, it was decided by NASA and ESA that by the time we would fly, and we thought at that point it might be only 10 years ahead, uh, there would have been far more of these Ariane launches than with our heavy lifters. Uh, that NASA is now doing with the help of the industry. And um, this is the 125th launch on an Ariane. So we're in pretty good shape in terms of experience, how to fly these uh, uh, rockets. And that's why the Ariane was selected. Thank you. Let's see. We have after launch, when will web begin its deployment process for the mirrors to unfold in the solar shield? That happens in the next couple of days and it will take a total of 29 days. And, then and how long is it going to take to get to L2? Does that take the entire transit time? Um, it takes about a month. And L2 is a very wide space. It's um, uh, four, four and a half times further away than the moon. And we're not sitting in a single point, but we describe a curly Alyssa Jew figure. Um, so after the second uh, course correction, we will arrive there uh, slightly more than a month and then start describing that uh, figure on the Grange point. Great questions. Looking at some more of the questions here. Rick, you will give us the uh, sound in the background so we don't we miss any. The most critical phase of the countdown. Can you outline yeah. some of the upcoming critical activities as we head into the. Here's a particularly control. exciting question for us here. Can you remind us about ASU's contributions to JWST? Well, a number of scientists here have been in, involved in JWST for over 20 years now. That's uh, Rolf Jensen, Seth Cohen, um, and myself, who uh, wrote a proposal uh, to do our part of the science in 2001, 2002. And we heard in the summer of 2002 that we were selected. Uh, and then, of course, the group has grown enormously. Many of the uh, students and postdocs who are on today uh, are also going to work on uh, James Webb. And, um, you can see him there in the, in the list of panelists and uh, attendees. There's uh, more than a dozen and a half or almost two dozen folks here in uh, our group that are going to be uh, working on this data in the next uh, decade. Wonderful. I'm sure it's so exciting for both you and the people who have just entered the field. Uh, another question that we have is, what are the cameras or other telemetry available that allow you to know how the telescope is doing in the unfolding and deployment process? Well, so we have a, a lot of sensors on board, no uh, cameras to look at the deployment itself. There was talk about that a long time ago, but that was an extra complexity. There are cameras on board the spacecraft and the fairing where you will see images of the uh, telescope, hopefully as it is being launched and then uh, being uh, disconnected from the upper stage um, after I believe around uh, 33 minutes into flight. So at some point you will um, you know, see it leave, so to speak, from the rocket. Um, 
And you may even see the uh, uh, solar panel deploying a few minutes after the separation. But that will be the final farewell. And then folks will uh, try to follow the telescope from the ground, of course, even with amateur telescopes and with professional telescopes. And then there is a, a, a large number of ground stations that will um, follow the orbit of the telescope with uh, radio waves. Great questions. Go back you mentioned to the live feed just for a little uh, check in here. Yeah. Just yeah, we should check. Nine it's minutes. It's a 27-minute uh, ride to orbit from uh, liftoff until the time that the uh, Webb Observatory is separated from the upper stage of the Ariane 5 rocket. Several minutes later, the commands will be given to unfurl its solar array, followed by the confirmation from the telescope controllers in Baltimore that uh, we are power positive, meaning that electrical current is flowing through that solar array. With us today, inside the so-called fishbowl, seated with mission controllers on the floor of the control room, is Raphael Chevrier of Ariane Spas. Raphael, how's everything looking? What's being discussed down there? Hi, Rob. Well, so far, so good. We just received the last uh, weather forecast. It's all green for the A0 that is uh, forecast right now. What we check was altitude winds, wind in the vicinity of the launch pad, and risk of lightning. So. Right now, uh, it's, a, it's a relief because the, the, the weather was a, a bit uh, tough in, in the last uh, couple of days, but right now everybody is very focused on the next steps. The start of the synchronized sequence at seven minutes before liftoff, last operations that Luz described earlier before Webb and the Ariane 5 are going to lift off and soar into the sky. Thanks, Raphael. We'll be back with you and Luz here shortly. We now have confirmation from Baltimore that James Webb is on internal power. Amidst all of this activity, we cannot forget that it is Christmas Day. 53 years ago, the astronauts of Apollo 8 completed their 10th and final orbit of the moon after reading from the book of Genesis on Christmas Eve to billions of people watching with rapt attention back on our planet. The astronauts then headed for home following their spacecraft's trans-Earth injection burn. Today, more than a half century later, we're just minutes away from another genesis, the genesis of new era of discovery. The launch of the James Webb Space Telescope is at hand. We're just uh, 38 uh, seconds away from entering the critical synchronized sequence. You're going to be hearing uh, all the critical calls from the DDO, the range operations manager, uh, who is Jean-Luc Voyer here in the uh, launch, uh, in the mission control center. There he is. He uh, will be calling the start of synchronized sequence, all of the critical countdown milestones, and uh, we will be uh, listening very intently for his calls. Let's stand by. À tous de DDO, attention pour la séquence finale lanceur. Top, à zéro moins sept minutes. And with that, we've entered uh, the period of uh, synchronized sequence. You heard uh, Luce Fabriguet just a moment or two ago uh, uh, explain uh, some of the critical activities. Uh, the first one coming up just a few seconds from now, which will be the uh, topping off of the main stage tanks. Uh, the uh, first or core stage was loaded earlier this morning with 175 tons of propellant, 150 tons of liquid uh, oxygen, and uh, 25 tons of liquid hydrogen, the upper stage loaded with 15 tons of propellant that will be the workhorse for a 16-minute burn to lift James Webb to its final orbit. Uh, at separation, some 27 minutes and seven seconds after launch, James Webb will be at an altitude of about 864 statute miles. To put that into perspective, some uh, 520 miles higher than the Hubble Space Telescope and more than 600 miles higher than the International Space Station. Webb at that point will be traveling about 21,000 miles an hour as it heads out to a highly elliptical halo-like racetrack orbit some 1 million miles from Earth to begin its scientific observations. In a little more than one minute from now, we will see the four tanks pressurized at their flight level 
for the last test before the ignition of the Vulcan engine. And in parallel, the electric system are also set in flight configurations on board computer. The electrical power, as for the telescope, it will switch from ground to internal power one minute before the launch, one minute and five seconds before the launch. And we are going to see minus six seconds. At minus six seconds, we will see the disconnection of the upper stage, these big cryotechnic arms you can see on this, uh, on this picture. Then, three seconds before the H0, the inertial platform that will give all the information about where it is to the launcher will be released. And at H0, the seven second sequence to ignite the Vulcan engine of the main start stage will start. That will take seven seconds, a little less than seven seconds, where the engine will start up to its flight regime. Once the computer has checked that the Vulcan engine is running normally, and you will see at that point a flame going stable at the outlet of the nozzle, and at that point, the onboard computer will ignite the two boosters that will enable to move the 770 tons of Ariane and Webb. Coming up on the T-minus four minute mark right now, uh, just a couple of milestones real quick. At the one minute, five second mark into the flight, uh, Ariane 5 will go through the period of maximum dynamic pressure, ma max Q as it's known. Uh, that uh, will be uh, the period of maximum aerodynamic forces on uh, the rocket itself. The uh, solid uh, rocket boosters, which will provide about 90% of the initial thrust off the launch pad, will uh, shut down and separate at the two minute, 21 second mark into the flight, followed a minute and five seconds after that by fairing jettison. That will expose the James Webb Space Telescope to uh, the environment of flight for the first time. The main stage separation or the first stage separation comes at the T minus at the uh, eight minute 47 second mark into the flight. And that will be about a 16 uh, minute burn of that upper stage engine. It will cut off uh, at about 24 minutes, 51 seconds into the flight. And then we'll go into a coast phase of about two and a half minutes to allow any oscillations to dampen out, provide the most pristine environment for the James Webb telescope before observatory separation. We're coming up on the uh, two minute, 50 second mark into the flight. Again, you're gonna be hearing critical calls down the stretch here from the DDO or the range operations manager, Jean-Luc Voyer. The weather is go. We have a green board, no issues being worked. NASA officials, including Greg Robinson on the right, uh, carefully uh, watching uh, the telemetry looking intently at the final couple of minutes of the countdown, lives have been spent in the preparation of the James Webb Space Telescope that is about to fly. And Beatrice Romero on his, uh, on his side on the left of the screen from Ion Space. And that is the uh, DDO, the Range Operations Manager, Jean-Luc Voyer, as we have hit the two minute mark in the countdown. The flight will be in two phases. You will see the first part of the flight. Oh, they're going to work from the outside. Phase. That will be the atmospheric part of the flight, the so atmospheric flight. And the trajectory will be driven by a very, to, to reduce the aerodynamic loads. And then we will have a very different exo-atmospheric flight after that. And, and you were watching a, a number of people, uh, VIPs and invited guests, moving out to the observation platform that is right next uh, to the Jupiter Control Center as we stand by for the one minute call from Jean-Luc Voyer. À tout de déo, attention pour moins une minute. Top, à zéro moins une minute. Thumbs up from Jean-Luc Voyer. All systems are go. We're inside a minute now, T minus 50 seconds and counting. As you heard earlier, uh, the Vulcan 2 engine will ignite. Turbo pumps will come up to flight speed for seven seconds and the command will be issued to ignite the solid rocket boosters. The James Webb te Space Telescope will be on its way. Now it's clouded it there, so you won't seconds. see it for very long.
standing by for terminal count. À tous de DDO, attention pour les deux comptes final. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, unité, top. Can we have engine start? And decollage. Decollage liftoff from a tropical rainforest to the edge of time itself. James Webb begins a voyage back to the birth of the universe. Punching a hole through the clouds, 20 seconds into the flight, good pitch program reported. About two minutes to the the Ariane 5 rocket continues uh, to fly uphill in nominal fashion. The rumble of the powerful the Ariane 5 now nominal. being felt here in the control center. 3D animation. We can hear the noise and feel the vibrations here. You're right, Rob. Yeah, impressive. 13 kilometers in altitude, seven kilometers downrange, traveling uh, about uh, 0.6 kilometers per second. Les paramètres à bord sont normaux. The trajectory reported to be nominal by Jean-Luc Voyer, the uh, range operations manager. You can see at the bottom of your screen, the yellow line is the trajectory plot, perfectly overlaid over the green line, which was the pre-launch trajectory. One minute, 41 seconds into the flight, about 40 seconds away from shutdown of the solid rocket boosters. Coming up on the two minute mark into the flight, When it detects the threshold on acceleration, the dis not the deceleration, but uh, less acceleration for the... Tous les sont normaux. Uh, uh, everything is okay. Everything is normal. Two and minutes, 15 seconds into the flight. Okay, the computer detects this threshold. It will separate. Separation des EAP. Done. We have confirmation of solid rocket booster separation from Jean-Luc Voyer. This coming at an altitude of 44 miles. The Ariane 5 and James Webb traveling almost 5,000 miles an hour. We have about one minute, five seconds to go before fairing jettison. That'll be the next critical milestone. The fairing is there to avoid the satellite being exposed to high temperatures and also high air flows. And as soon as the launcher leaves the atmosphere, as is now the case, the satellite does not need anymore to be protected and, and web does not need anymore to be protected. So each kilogram being very important for the performance of the launch, we are going to eject this no more useful fairing. And let's go down to the floor uh, in the Jupiter Control Center to Raphael Chevrier of Ariane Spas. Raphael, so far so good. Hi, Rob. So far, so good. Everything is nominal, as uh, we say, when attitude and trajectory of the Ariane 5 is going perfectly well. As you can see also on the yellow line on the screen, we had the confirmation of the uh, separation of the two sweet boosters and now of the fairing, meaning that we have crossed the limits of the atmosphere. So everything is going super good. And the DDO just said that all parameters are going perfectly, perfectly smoothly. So let's continue the mission. And Raphael, uh, this is a view uh, from the upper stage camera called the Vicky Cam, looking back at the James Webb Space Telescope. This is on about a 20 second delay or so because of the way the imagery is processed uh, here in the control room. There's your telescope ready to unfurl uh, its uh, wings basically and begin uh, its uh, journey to a, the Lagrange point, the L2 point about a million miles away from Earth. The trajectory is nominal. Trajectory is nominal, the report from Jean-Luc Voyer. The 
liftoff time confirmed here in the Mission Control Center at 12.20 Greenwich Mean Time, 9.20 a.m. Peru Time, 7.20 a.m. Eastern Time. The Ariane 5 and James Webb, 181 uh, kilometers in altitude, 450 kilometers downrange from the launch site here in Kourou. Flight control is very smooth. Five minutes, 12 seconds into the flight. We have about uh, three and a half minutes to go in uh, main stage or first stage uh, performance. And again, you can see at the bottom of your screen the uh, yellow uh, plot line overlaid over the green line, meaning uh, we are right on course, right down the pike, and a perfect trajectory so far for the Ariane 5 rocket. Tu permettre bord ce normal. All telemetry data are now received by the Galio tracking station, which is, clo which is close to here, where we are in Kourou. It will track the launcher up to the ignition of its upper stage, and then we'll, we'll have the natal station in Brazil, Ascension, in the, as you can see on the map, in the middle of the ocean, and the two last stations in Africa, Libreville and Malindi, one on the east coast, the other one on the west coast. And the one on the west coast, Malindi, you can see that the satellite will be, the telescope will be separated more, over, more or less over this Malindi station. And this Malindi station will also acquire the telemetry data from the telescope. You can see both are green, Galio and Dantal on this animation. It means they are expected to receive the, da the data, and it was confirmed right now by the launch operations manager. That Par la station du Natal au Brésil. And just confirming now that telemetry is being processed uh, through the Brazilian tracking station. The telescope is also uh, processing telemetry through the tracking and data relay satellite system. As it uh, moves further and further out into deep space, all of the telescope's uh, telemetry and its imagery ultimately will be processed through the deep space network in Goldstone, California. We pass the seven minute mark into the flight. A perfect ride uh, so far on the Ariane 5. We have about uh, one and a half minutes to go in the first stage performance. Once uh, the main stage uh, engine is commanded to cut off, it will be uh, jettisoned. And just a few seconds after that, the upper stage engine will, will ignite. And it uh, will be the workhorse for a 16 minute burn that will put uh, James Webb into its preliminary orbit. About 11 minutes from now, uh, telescope controllers at uh, the Space Telescope Science Institute will be sending commands to prepare James Webb for the initial uh, series of commissioning activities uh, that will lead to, to the deployment of its solar array and uh, the initiation of generation of electrical power for the telescope. About 30 seconds away from main engine cutoff, Nominal trajectory continues uh, to be the watchword for the day from the range operations manager, Jean-Luc Voyer, as we stand by for main engine shutdown and separation. Extinction de l'EPC. And we have main stage shutdown and separation confirmed here in the Mission Control Center and the ignition of that upper and stage. Mercy. And Raphael Chevrier down uh, in the fishbowl. Uh, so far, so good. Yes, Rob, we have the confirmation of the separation of the main stage and the ignition the of the upper stage. The trajectory is perfectly nominal. This is very important moment for us because it's always a, uh, a challenge to switch on a cryogenic engine in space condition and we are now at 220 kilometers of altitude speed is a bit more than seven kilometers per second as we enter now the second stage of uh, the second uh, phase uh, of uh, the flight 
the upper stage is going to power for about, for about 16 minutes to place Webb on its transfer orbit. And right now, everything is again nominal, as the DDO just said. And a short time from now, uh, the uh, so-called sawtooth maneuver uh, will get underway. The, again, uh, like rocking a baby in a cradle, this will be a maneuver to keep Webb's optics protected from overheating loose. Exactly, Rob, like a baby in a cradle. Uh, you can see here Webb attached on top of Ariane 5 upper stage with a very specific configuration. Of course, it will be different uh, during its lifetime, but for the time being, it's, uh, it's, it's sun shield is folded and not yet Can fully protected in the observatory. A number of uh, exhaustive studies have been performed by the mission teams in, in Europe, in the US, on the thermal conditioning inside the telescope and the way the rays of the sun would propagate and interact with sensitive equipment inside the telescope. The maintain this thermal conditioning is really key before separating this, uh, this telescope. And in particular, we know that one face of the telescope cannot face the sun. That's why the, and to produce these right thermal conditions inside the web, a specific roll low has been designed, what we call the SOTUS approach. And if you are if you are watching carefully to these images, La you can see this animation, phenomenal. you can see that the upper stage is going 30 degrees on one side, then 30 degrees on the other side, going back and forth this way to to maintain this uh, perfect thermal conditioning for the for the telescope. It's uh, worthwhile noting that uh, after Webb separates from the upper stage uh, of the Ariane 5 rocket, which continues to perform in excellent fashion at coming up on the 12 minute mark into the flight, uh, the telescope controllers uh, will be taking the baton, if you will, from the mission controllers here in Kourou. Uh, the first steps will be the opening of fuel valves, a pair of fuel valves, to start flowing fuel to Webb's onboard thrusters. Uh, they then will power on the valve drive electronics. Uh, those are powered on in preparation to control and fire those thrusters when required. Webb's solar array is scheduled to be deployed at approximately the 33 minute Philippe mark into the flight. Once it is locked in place, we'll get the call uh, that uh, electricity is flowing through the array. That call uh, will come from the mission operations manager, Carl Starr, who is at the uh, Space Telescope Science Institute at Johns Hopkins in Baltimore. Uh, seated right behind him in that control room is Alicia Starr, uh, a pair of stars uh, helping to guide uh, James Webb on its discovery of the stars. Alicia Starr is the uh, lead uh, engineer for launch and ascent events. Uh, once the solar array is deployed and declared power positive, uh, then a uh, three out of the four hold downs for the aft deployed radiator will be released to prevent binding due to the cool down of the telescope's composite structure. The contamination control heaters will be enabled to protect instrument optics on web from any water ice condensation as they cool down. The actuator drive unit will be powered on. This particular mechanism helps with heater La control of the fine steering mirror, normal. preventing water ice con uh, condensation later to be used uh, to position each of the mirror's segments. All six reaction wheels and the wheel drive electronics will be powered on for Webb, and that will be the precursor to the attitude control system using those reaction wheels to maintain the proper orientation with the sun, as opposed to using onboard thrusters. Uh, of course, fuel uh, in those thrusters, very valuable. It's a, a limited commodity for the lifetime of James Webb's uh, observations of the universe. We're 13 minutes, 55 seconds Philippe into the flight. Jean-Luc uh, Voyer, the uh, range operations manager, continues to report a nominal performance for James Webb. That and is again, real Oaks, uh, again from the European Space Agency, uh, how is this uh, trajectory uh, being uh, carefully and methodically adjusted uh, to provide the uh, correct parameters uh, in the final stages of ascent? Yes, Rob, as you can see on this plot, 
the, the altitude is slightly going down. It's perfectly normal. The launch vehicle is uh, really on the, on the line where it should be. This decrease of its altitude, slight decrease of its altitude, will allow the launcher to benefit and the upper stage to benefit of the gravity effect and to increase its velocity until it reaches a thermal threshold. It's about to reach it or even already reached, reached it now and it will go up and now it will go up and up, up to the separation of the Webb telescope. It will separate the Webb telescope on a highly elliptic orbit, but still around the Earth. The satellite, the telescope will be released, inserted on a orbit around the Earth with an apogee, a very high apogee above uh, 1 million kilometers. Trajectory uh, nominal as reported by Jean-Luc uh, Vaurier. You see him in that uh, view, 185 kilometers in altitude. Uh, some 4,500 kilometers downrange from the launch site here in Karoo, moving at uh, more than uh, eight kilometers per second, uh, right on the plot, right on the trajectory, everything looking great. We are, are about uh, nine minutes away from the completion of upper stage ignition, its shutdown, and then about a two and a half minute coast phase before Webb will separate. Observatory separation will be called out. You'll be hearing uh, those calls and the initial calls uh, from Carl Starr, the mission operations manager at the Space Telescope Science Institute at Johns Hopkins through solar array deploy and the declaration of a power positive spacecraft. Uh, you know, James Webb, of course, will be traveling well beyond the moon uh, to a distance of about a million miles away from Earth, settling into a highly elliptical halo-like orbit to begin its astronomical observations. And again, as we mentioned earlier, at the time of observatory separation, Webb will be at an altitude of approximately 864 miles, statute miles, traveling some 21,000 miles uh, an hour. Well, excellent so far. We're about eight minutes away from upper stage uh, shutdown. The uh, stage has performed uh, as planned. No issues reported. Uh, the launch occurring at 12.20 Greenwich Mean Time, 9.20 Karoo Time, 7.20 a.m. Eastern Time on this Christmas Day. So the fellow to the left is... Uh, the velocity you just mentioned is very important, Rob. The velocity you just mentioned at separation of the telescope is very important. It will be slightly below, okay, give it in a kilometer per second, but it will be slightly below 10 kilometer per second because it's important that the satellite, the telescope, is not inserted on an escape orbit. It will be placed on a terrestrial orbit so that there will be time for the layoff, for the, for the early phase operations on the, and the commissioning of the telescope. And that will be, in fact, the upper stage that will leave this orbit and goes toward an escape liberation orbit. And of course, even uh, though we're still in powered flight, the uh, trajectory, the acceleration, the speed at which James Webb is going towards its preliminary orbit, all modeled in advance, uh, in advance and uh, carefully choreographed to maintain as a quiescent an atmosphere and environment around the telescope uh, for its ultimate separation from the upper stage of the Ariane 5 rocket, which is about uh, six and a half minutes from now. Eighteen and a half minutes into the flight. It's very quiet now here in the uh, control center here in Karoo. NASA officials, European Space Agency officials, Ariane Spas officials, all watching uh, telemetry very carefully. And as uh, the upper stage uh, continues to burn uh, nominally and sheds fuel, uh, the acceleration uphill uh, for the James Webb Space Telescope continues to increase as we approach the 20-minute mark into the flight. 
again. Upper stage cutoff is scheduled at the 24 minute 51 second mark into the flight, about five and a half minutes from now. After the cutoff of this main engine, as you said, uh, Rob, we will have a short ballistic phase, a short coasting phase that will, uh, when, when the upper stage will rely fully on its, at what we call the attitude and roll control system. And it will adjust its, its attitude so that during this so small ballistic phase, all the requirements from the telescope are fully met and that at the separation, when, when there will be the separation, the conditions will be very smooth and as requested for the telescope beginning of life. Today's countdown uh, was as flawless as uh, you can imagine. Uh, the weather uh, was perfect uh, all the way through the early morning hours, uh, through the uh, fueling process of the vehicle. The weather's been a bit dicey here in Karoo over the past few days, but everything fell together on this Christmas day uh, to send uh, a new present to the world's astronomer. 20 minutes, 40 seconds into the flight. All parameters nominal as reported by Jean-Luc Voyer, the range operations manager. Four minutes of powered flight remaining. The fellow you saw there, blue shirt, gray hair, is Bill Oakes, the Goddard space flight manager of the James Webb project. And the other fellow um, to his left um, is uh, Scott Willoughby, the uh, um, project director at uh, Northrop Grumman for Webb. The telemetry of the launch vehicle is acquired for the time being by the Libreville tracking station on the western coast of Africa. Flight control is nominal, the trajectory is uh, fully normal, fully as expected as you can see on the on the plot with the red with the yellow plot uh, over the green one that is the expected one. Twenty two minutes into the flight. Less than three minutes of powered flight Pilotage remaining. Et calme. Smooth flight control. And again, as we've mentioned uh, before, everything uh, nominal reported by the range operations manager, as we've mentioned before, this is a long ride uphill for the James Webb Space Telescope to put it at the proper position in the sky uh, so that it can escape from the Earth, basically head beyond the moon towards its final orbit. Uh, for uh, its commissioning activities that will be the dominant feature of uh, all of the operations from the Space Telescope Science Institute over the course of the next several weeks. And the launch operations manager announced the acquisition by, uh, by, by, Lindy, by, the, by the Malindi station as expected for the last, for the end of the flight and the last uh, part of the upper stage flight and the separation of the telescope. James Webb is about four minutes away from... Roger, there's a suggestion that maybe uh, we could be able um, to explain like what L2 again is and the goal, like where Webb is headed and how long they'll take to get there. Just a bit earlier in the broadcast... Uh, we'll yes, would you like to take an opportunity to explain Webb's orbit in a little bit more detail? Uh, Liam? Oh, sure, I can try. Uh, so, uh, well, there's uh, a lot of different ways that a spacecraft can uh, be put into space. And uh, for example, the Hubble Space Telescope um, was put into space in an orbit around Earth at a relatively low altitude um, so that it can go around and we can access it pretty easily with things like the shuttle program. And that allowed us to repair it after the initial problems that happened. Uh, but uh, Webb is going to be very different in that it's going to travel to what is called a Lagrange point. And uh, people will jump in and correct me if I'm making a mistake here, but... Hey, hey Liam, 
let me just take a look at the We're coming up on a milestone. We'll come back to you with 15 tons of propellant for this long 16 minute burn. Now, about 30 seconds away from upper stage cutoff. That's why you may get some images from the camera on board of the telescope as it separates. And we're standing by for upper stage shutdown and uh, the cutoff of the uh, upper stage engine. Extinction USC. The extinction of the the shutoff of the, the cutoff of the engine was confirmed exactly as expected. The exactly expected altitude and speed and velocity. So now we are we have entered the coasting phase, the ballistic phase that will last for a little more than two minutes. Now over Africa. Controllers uh, in Baltimore uh, confirming that uh, all of the uh, function uh, parameters for the James Webb Space Telescope have been loaded on board the telescope. Uh, we are expecting uh, web separation at the 27 minute 7 second mark here into the flight. Just over a minute from now, springs will gently push Webb away from the upper stage of the Ariane 5. As it moves further and further away from uh, the upper stage, uh, there'll be what uh, we refer to as a collision avoidance maneuver. Yes, yes, Rob, exactly. The springs already will give some distancing, of course, between the two objects, between the telescope and the upper stage. And then the upper stage will leave the trajectory of the telescope and makes a special maneuver to pass the telescope and heads towards a liberation orbit and leaves the telescope on its, on its uh, orbit uh, without any risk of collision and without any risk of pollution towards the telescope. And we're about uh, 17 seconds away from web separation. There we go. Now it's an observatory. Separation Web Space Telescope. Go Web! We do have confirmation of observatory separation. The James Webb Space Telescope amidst applause here in the Mission Control Center, now taking its first steps in pursuit of cosmological discovery. It was a perfect ride to orbit. And all of the uh, separation uh, sequence events are running in good fashion, according to the telescope controllers. There you go. And there is the view uh, from the upper stage camera on the Ariane 5, looking at the James Webb Space Telescope as it moves uh, gently away from go its launch go. vehicle. Free at last. Fantastic pictures of this telescope. Go going. web, go web. Yes, go web. Oh, let gravity do its thing. It will be... Uh, Ironically enough, as we marvel on uh, this view from the upper stage camera, this will be humanity's last view of the James Webb te Space Telescope as it moves to its workplace about a million miles away from Earth. Yes, you're right, Rob. Impressive fantastic pictures yeah now we'll be hearing uh, shortly from the mission operations manager at the space telescope science institute uh, carl Starr, who will be uh, calling out uh, the procedures that will lead uh, to the deployment of webb's solar array there we go And 
down uh, in the fishbowl uh, where there is jubilation. Let's go to Raphael uh, Chevrier of Ariane Spas. And before we do that, uh, Raphael, uh, uh, a bit earlier than planned, but there is the solar array having been deployed. James Webb now uh, has its array out as we stand by for a confirmation that it is power positive. We've got power. Hey, Rob. That's it. I don't understand what he says. Have you heard or not? And there it is. There's your critical call. James Webb not only has legs, but it has power as it uh, begins uh, its journey and the commissioning activities to follow. And with that, let's go down to the floor uh, in the fishbowl and uh, Raphael Chevrier of Ariane Spas. This is it. We have witnessed and the confirmation that Ariane 5 has safely delivered Webb into space. The upper stage is now being placed on a safe um, escape orbit around the sun. But honestly, I've got to tell you that these images are absolutely incredible. And it, well, it may be the end of the mission for Ariane Space, but it's only the beginning of the journey for Webb. It's now on its way to the Lagrange point. Congratulations to all the team involved in the flight. Really, there is no words to describe the emotion that uh, is happening right now in the fishbowl. So uh, all I can say is good luck, Webb. And bring us incredible data from the deep universe. At that point, our sequence will continue. Well, Raphael, uh, congratulations on a uh, perfect ride to orbit uh, from the Ariane 5 out of Karoo here today. A view here in the uh, Space Telescope Science Institute. Their work just beginning on a new era of scientific observations. Uh, Luce Fabregat, uh, it was a smooth ride to orbit. Everything went uh, by the book, almost like a simulation, without any problems. And uh, we thank you for all of your insight throughout the course of the day. Thanks to you, Rob, and really a great achievement. I have many faces and names now coming up to my mind, and uh, really you can be proud of what, uh, what was achieved on both sides of the Atlantic Ocean. Thanks a lot to you. Tremendous uh, jubilation here in the uh, control center. You're looking at Jean-Luc uh, Voyer, the range operations manager. Quite a Christmas present for the world's astronomers as the James Webb Space Telescope begins its life heading towards deep space. With that, uh, we're going to go back to the floor now uh, to uh, Katie Haswell. Katie, we did our thing. It's up to you now. Oh my goodness, I just can't tell you. It's such utter jubilation here on the floor in the Jupiter oh, Control well, Center. Everybody's been enough, whooping with joy. Yes, the sir, controllers here PCR3 and the mission controllers no jumping up, that. clapping, whooping with joy, people I'll hugging. And I have to say, I my throat was caught as I saw the, the, the glimpse of sunshine um, on web solar panels as, oh, as we watched it heading out into space oh, on its journey ahead. to its oh, working yes, zone. Go it's going to take about PCR six months before we start PCR getting um, our deep space observations uh, from where, of course, the teams have got a huge amount to do uh, before we get to that. And our best wishes with all those teams in Baltimore. I want to get some reaction. Right now, everybody is talking and hugging each other because they're feeling so excited, and I totally understand that. Let's start, though, by going over to the NASA administrator, Bill Nelson. So everybody's very excited. That's Scott Willoughby, the Northrop manager. He's launched many, many things for Northrop. And that's Bill Oakes. In the good old Hubble days, 10 years ago, he was called and Greg Robinson, Blue Mask. Bill Oakes has been managing the project for the last 10 years or so. Administrator Bill Nelson, right now, looking at these jubilant sailors here in the Mission Control Center in Kourou, the European spaceport. Roger, we in interrupted uh, Liam. There are the teams. The yeah. This might be a good, good time to go back. Yeah, yeah, now they're celebrating, so we can take some more questions. Uh, 
before we open the Christmas wine. I think we can all celebrate and give everybody a high five and a round of applause for this momentous occasion. Congratulations, you guys. Well, thank you for all your help, Karen and Kim and Rick and so many others, Alex, Meg, too many to mention. And of course, all the students and postdocs, Rolf and Seth. It's been only a 20 year ride, but we're used to that with Hubble's being 31 and a half years and counting. And by the way, I can't resist before we get to Liam answering the question further. On December 31st, you might be missing out on an important birthday of Hubble. As you know, Hubble was launched on April 24th, 1990. It's going into its 32nd year next April. December 31st, I have to still calculate which hour of the day Hubble is turning a billion seconds old. Yeah, that's yeah. worth celebrating. Okay, Indeed. Liam, I'll give the word to you. <laughs> I'll have a chart for you, Liam. You can talk to the chart if you like. Rick, we might sure. come back to this later. That's fine. No worry, I'll keep it up. And I do want to say, um, just because I, I also have first person experience of, of this, I do want to say a special thank you to Kim and, and all the other, and, and Rick and Meg and all the Marston folks just for setting all this up. It's been really incredible. Um, so with L2, uh, basically uh, what I was talking about was how Webb is going to be going to a point which is called a Lagrange point. And basically, if you have uh, two bodies that are orbiting each other, in our case, we're talking about the sun and the earth, uh, you essentially have a set of different points in space uh, where if you are in essentially what is called a reference frame, where the sun and the earth, you can say they're stationary, they're orbiting around each other, but you can just say that you're following along with them and they're, at, uh, they're staying still. You can essentially have certain places in space where uh, the gravitational and centrifugal and different forces of the system all balance out so that you can stay in a single point uh, respective to the two objects and not have to move based on their different forces. Uh, one of those Lagrange points, L2, is on the line if you connect the sun and then the earth, and then there's a third point called L2, which is further out than the earth, and that point which is several million miles away from Earth, I don't know the exact number, uh, is where Webb is going to orbit. Um, and it can just stay there respective to the Earth and the Sun as everything sort of moves in a circle. Um, and that's gonna take about a month for Webb to get out there. So, and the L2 is not a single point. Well, it is, but you know, it, it's the volume around it where you uh, sort of uh, counteract the gravity of the uh, earth and the sun in the sense that you can stay there in a semi-stable way. It's not completely stable. And when the earth goes around the sun every 365 days, the telescope will go with the earth around the sun and the moon, of course. Um, and it will also describe a vertical as well as a horizontal amplitude there that are each about a million kilometers uh, wide. So it's, it's really about a 10 to the 18 cubic kilometer volume where it swims around in this Lissajou loop type figure. It's a function of time. And every few weeks you need to spend a little propellant to keep it there. Otherwise it will just start orbiting the sun like a planet. And you don't want that, you want to stay close to Earth so you can communicate with it. Excellent explanation there, Liam, and good question. I know we're nearing our time. I'd be happy to take some more questions. I've been typing up some answers. So <clears throat> I had another question on the timeline. You may have seen uh, some of these charts. Um, oh. Can you see this chart here? Yes, we can see it. Okay, with um, the arrow to the right. So today we did the first one hour, uh, not quite yet. And I, so, I think we're seeing the wrong chart, Roger. Ah, uh, okay. So you, um, let me see, try again. Mm. Uh, no. 
wasn't so lucky here. Um, let me share this then. Um, this one. You see that? Yes. Yeah, that's good. So today yes. we did launch and, and 30 some minutes with the separation of the upper stage and the deployment of the solar uh, uh, panel, which of course is critical for power. And um, that was the solar array, um, 31 minutes. And now we get to mid course correction, the first one in 12 hours, 12 and a half hours uh, after launch and then other course corrections and then slowly but surely the uh, deployment of the various parts, the big tennis court size sun shield and then the secondary mirror comes down over the top and the two side panels each with three hexagonal mirrors move forward and that happens all in the next 30 days. And then it's time for cooling. The telescope literally has to be cooled. So it will go through a couple of days of cooling um, has already been doing that for the first month. And then there is a good um, almost 90 days um, where the uh, focusing of the telescope will be done through many iterations of taking images and making sure all 18 mirrors perfectly align to within uh, fractions of tens of nanometers. And then for the last 60 days here in purple, there will be the calibration of the instruments where they take what we call the, the flat fields and the dark current frames and make sure that all the spectrographs work and all the calibration frames that astronomers want to use to calibrate their images. And then 180 days for now, if all goes well, of course, there could be you know some things that they didn't expect that take a little longer or even a little shorter. It should be ready. That's the plan uh, for observations. Roger, just so just to be clear, I'm, if I'm reading this right, it's somewhere around the first of February we're just going to see first images. We'll see um, little... Yeah, but it, it will be of a single star. They will look at 18 images on the detector that will look like uh, little hexagons uh, that are still out of focus, and they have to first um, co-align. Well, first have to do a gross focusing of the the, the mirrors. And, and then co-align them all, make sure all 18 images from each of the 18 mirrors will fall on top of each other and make a, a brighter star, if you wish, that looks almost like a point source. The and so the mission, they're not going to release that. And they, they expect that to be a fair bit of work. So they will right. tell us at the end if it has worked properly. But that's what they're going to do. The other thing I always worry about when I see it is the deployment of the Mylar sun shields and that really complicated process. Where does that happen in this time? Um, that starts here in the orange uh, part right around. I have a timeline for it somewhere. I'll see if I can find it. Um, but sometimes soon after the uh, course corrections. The course corrections, of course, will um, accelerate the spacecraft. So it's one of the first things they do after getting the solar array out today is to get that big sun shield. So the, the two pallets that have the sun shield folded up on them will open up. Then it has the total length of the observatory. And then telescopic booms will roll it out in the other direction. And then there's a system of um, pulleys and guy wires that will lift the five layers of Kapton up above each other. They're in total about um, a meter apart from the hot layer one to the cold layer five. And that takes a good number of days and they take that very slowly. They say it will be like watching grass grow. So they can't hurry any of this since you have to do everything right in the right order. Let's see if there's any other questions in the chat or in the Q and A. I have, have a, a, gra I have a graphic I can share with you. Yeah, go the ahead. Please do. Up, so that shows the timeline.
Well, this would be a good reference uh, for people just to kind of watch the progress. It looks like this is the one to kind of go to if you're just curious about what stage is. Maybe Kim, you could share this uh, link. Yeah, I'll put. I did earlier. I'll um, okay. I'll reshare it now. But it is a good resource to follow along with. Unless we want to just broadcast for 180 days. Okay. Um. I think we have like one more question and then we can probably wrap it up so everybody can get started with their Christmas morning festivities. I'm answering some questions as we go. Are the answers visible to everybody, Karen or Kim? They would have to be looking at the uh, Q&A soon. So you might just want to just mention some of the things that you can yeah. answer. Yeah, Rolf is already answering some of those. Thank you. Uh, excellent. Well, thank you all for showing up here on Christmas morning afternoon. For those in Europe, there's a fair number of our family members in Europe as well. Thank you all for coming and friends. And friends from the HST world have joined us. Uh, thank you all for, for coming. And Let's hope that the deployment will go well the next month and the journey to L2 and then the two months of focusing and the two months of instrument calibration. And that we will be getting some beautiful images in late June next year. Roger, I think we also need to congratulate you. You've been working on this project longer than anybody, of course, in the ASU team. So this must be amazing for, uh, for you personally to see this thing launch and get up there and anticipate. The, um, the science that's going to come back. Well, thank you, Rick. It, uh, it feels like a little bit of a short haul because I've worked on Hubble twice as long, but you know, we, uh, we're <laughs> lucky that we still have Hubble. Billion second birthday coming up for Hubble on December 31st. And uh, by the way, it's between seven and 16 years past its uh, warranty. It's, you know, living by the grace of God on Hubble, it's still working, but we don't know for how much longer. Well, let's cross our fingers that Webb does the same thing. So yep. what, is, what is its nominal mission? Does it have like a, a, a sort of a nominal goal that makes it successful? So the requirement is five years. The goal is okay. 10 years and we have propellant on board for 14 years if all goes well and they schedule it, right? That's an optimistic scenario, but it's possible. And as long as they keep scheduling, you know, looking at various points in the sky, alternatingly not staring at too much of the same point in the sky too long, which costs propellant at some point, then they might run it past 10 years. Of course, the parts, the spare parts need to live that long, but for Hubble, many cases it has. And there's a considerable, considerable redundancy between the capabilities of the different instruments. So yep. even if one instrument is no longer performing as well, other instruments can take over their, uh, that role, at least to, to some extent. Yep. So that's a different way of designing a space telescope than Hubble. Yep. Uh, redundancy was built in from the start. That's certainly true, Rolf. We hope to have everything working in, in June, but if something flunks out in f five or eight years, then there's a good chance that another camera or spectrograph can take over many of the functions. Okay, so we're a little bit after six. Do you want to take any more questions or would do you want to get See on? If there are any our... more questions? Oh, there's more open ones. Uh, I, I assume you can collect these. I'll, open, I'll answer the ones that are out now quickly. Um, well, many of them are compliments. Um, let's see. There's a good question is what is the first far object to be observed? So something in the, you were talking about the calibration and alignment and all that stuff. When are we going to first see some uh, object deep in space? 
Well, there is a program called the EROs, the Early Release Science Observations. And we did them for Hubble as well. And um, their list is actually secret. I don't know what they are either, but for Hubble, we've seen them there, these beautiful images of nearby uh, star clusters and, and nebulae like the Eagle Nebulae and uh, parts of a deep field, maybe parts of Andromeda, of course, a planet, they'll probably start looking at one of Jupiter's moons. And um, there will be, uh, um, you know, a dozen or more of these initial shots that they take very quickly um, and then put out to the media with it, as soon as they're ready to announce that their ring works. So the EROs is the thing to look for, the press release, hopefully by the end of June, six months from now, okay. that will show us all these beautiful images. And then the real science observations start, such as the ones that Wolf and Seth and I and a number of others online, I noticed Madeline was here, and a, a number of folks have, uh, and Brenda Fry, observations on the uh, web telescope. And uh, um, that will hopefully also start in the, in the summer, maybe July, depends on when the schedule permits. Great questions, you all. Thank you all for coming. I'd be happy to hang around a bit more, but I don't want to keep you from your family, uh, Karen and Kim, so people need to go, I understand. You can leave me host for a few minutes, I'll say hi to my family when everybody else leaves, but... We can stop, I'll stop the recording.